for joining me. Yeah, that's definitely delicious. All right. I'm going to finish this off. Set that glass aside. Close up the infinity bottle. We've got a little bit of 25 year in there, as you can see. <clears throat> and now what I'd like to do is introduce you to my new celebration bottle. This is the Balvany 17-year double wood. Now, if you know anything about scotch at all, if you've ever been to a bar that has a decent scotch selection, maybe a nice steakhouse, they will have the Balvany 12-year double wood. <laughs> it's pretty common. It's delicious. I've finished off, I think, two bottles of the Balvany 12-year double wood, but I had never seen the 17-year until just recently, so this was not a cheap bottle. It's apparently increasing in value. Prices on this are going up, so I am going to reserve this as my new celebration bottle and open it with you tonight, assuming I can figure out how to start the foil. There we go. some of that out because that was a little tougher to get into than I had anticipated. Let's uh, pop the cork on this guy. Oh, lovely. Holy sh Nikes. There's my other clean crystal scotch glass for tonight. I love that. Check it out. tremendous. Okay. New celebration bottle for sure. That is outstanding. Let's get on with the final chapter of Tuesdays with Maury. <clears throat> I've bored you enough with the scotch happenings already this evening. So if you'll recall, the last chapter, chapter 25, was entitled, oh, there we go, the 14th Tuesday, we say goodbye. So skip ahead to chapter 
skip ahead in time as far as the timeline of the book goes to chapter 26 and this one is entitled Graduation <sighs> Maury died on a Saturday morning his immediate family was with him in the house. Rob made it in from Tokyo. He got to kiss his father goodbye. And John was there. And of course, Charlotte was there. And Charlotte's cousin, Marcia, who had written the poem that so moved Maury at his unofficial memorial service. The poem that likened him to a tender sequoia. Sequoia. They slept in shifts around his bed. Maury had fallen into a coma two days after our final visit, and the doctor said he could go at any moment. Instead, he hung on through a tough afternoon, through a dark night. Finally, on the 4th of November, when those he loved had left the room for just a moment to grab coffee in the kitchen, the first time none of them were with him since the coma began, Maury stopped breathing, and he was gone. I believe he died this way on purpose. I believe he wanted no chilling moments, no one to witness his last breath and be haunted by it. The way he had been haunted, by his mother's death notice telegram, or by his father's corpse in the city morgue. I believe he knew that he was in his own bed, that his books and his notes and his small hibiscus plant were nearby. He wanted to go serenely, and that is how he went. The funeral was held on a damp, windy morning. The grass was wet, and the sky was the color of milk. We stood by the hole in the earth, close enough to hear the pond water lapping against the edge and see ducks shaking off their feathers. Although hundreds of people had wanted to attend, Charlotte kept this gathering small, just a few close friends and relatives. Rabbi Axelrod read a few poems. Maury's brother, David, who had still walked with a limp from his childhood polio, lifted the shovel and tossed dirt in the grave as per tradition. At one point, Maury's ashes were placed into the ground. I glanced around the cemetery. Maury was right. It was indeed a lovely spot. Trees and grass and a sloping hill. You talk, I'll listen, he had said. I tried doing that in my head, to my happiness found that the imagined conversation felt almost natural. I looked down at my hands, saw my watch, and realized why. It was Tuesday. A poem by E. E. Cummings, read by Maury's son, Rob, at the memorial service. My father moved through days of we, singing each new leaf out of each tree, and every child was sure that spring had danced when she heard my father sing. Conclusion I look back sometimes at the person I was before I rediscovered my old professor. I want to talk to that person. I want to tell him what to look out for, what mistakes to avoid. I want to tell him to be more open, to ignore the lure of advertised values, to pay attention when your loved ones are speaking, as if it were the last time you might hear them. I mostly want to tell that person to get on an airplane and visit a gentle old man in West Newton, Massachusetts, sooner rather than later before that old man gets sick and loses his ability to dance. I know I cannot do this. None of us can undo what we've done or relive a life already recorded. But if Professor
Professor Maury Schwartz taught me anything at all, it was this. There is no such thing as too late in life. He was changing until the day he said goodbye. Not long after Maury's death, I reached my brother in Spain. We had a long talk. I told him I respected his distance, and that all I wanted was to be in touch, in the present, not just the past, to hold him in my life as much as he could let me. You're my only brother, I said. I don't want to lose you. I love you. I had never said such a thing to him before. A few days later, I received a message on my fax machine. It was typed in the sprawling, poorly punctuated, all-cap letters fashion that had always characterized my brother's words. Hi, I've joined the 90s, it began. <clears throat> he wrote a few little stories, what he'd been doing that week, a couple of jokes. At the end, he signed off this way. I have heartburn and diarrhea at the moment. Life's a bitch. Chat later. Signed. Sore. Tush. I laughed until there were tears in my eyes. This book was largely Maury's idea. He called it our final thesis. Like the best of work projects, it brought us closer together, and Maury was delighted when several publishers expressed interest, even though he died before meeting any of them. The advance money helped pay Maury's enormous medical bills, and for that, we were both grateful. The title, by the way, we came up with one day in Maury's office. He liked naming things. He had several ideas, but when I said, how about Tuesdays with Maury, he smiled in an almost blushing way, and I knew that was it. After Maury died, I went through boxes of old college material, and I discovered a final paper I had written for one of his classes. It was twenty years old now. On the front page were my penciled comments scribbled to Maury, and beneath them were his comments scribbled back. Mine began, Dear Coach. His began, Dear Player. For some reason, each time I read that, I miss him more. Have you ever really had a teacher? One who saw you as a raw but precious thing, a jewel that, with wisdom, could be polished out to a pure shine. If you are lucky enough to have your way, <clears throat> if you are lucky enough to find your way to such teachers, you will always find your way back. Sometimes it is only in your head. Sometimes it is right along their beds. The last class of my old professor's life took place once a week in his home by a window in his study where he could watch a small hibiscus plant shed its pink flowers. The class met on Tuesdays. No books were required. The subject was the meaning of life. It was taught from experience. The teaching goes on. And that is the conclusion of Tuesdays with Maury by Mitch Alpham. So that last paragraph was a callback to the very first paragraph of the book. Um, it was a, a very nice way to tie things together, I think. And uh, as I've mentioned before, this book was published in 1997. So that's why it feels a little out of date and fax machines and whatnot. And I first, uh, not first, when I received this, it was in 2005 from a man that I respect very much, right as my first child was being born. And uh, he wrote on the 
side cover for me. Um, wishing me a prosperous 2005. So actually, he received, uh, he, he gifted this book to me in the fall of 2004. Yes, because my first son was born in October of 2004. So that's when it was. And I've read it probably four times. This might have been the fourth or fifth time I've read this book since then in the intervening 16 years. Um, and I always learn something new from it, as I usually do with the leadership books and personal development books that I read and then reread because I like them so much. Um, one of the reasons I started this channel was because my philosophy is if you're not learning something every day, even if you're relearning something that you've forgotten and needed to remind yourself about, then it's a day wasted. So part of the reason I do this, um, beyond just loving ASMR videos myself, and I sleep do them every night, and enjoying the fact that uh, uh, just spoken word ASMR is what relaxes me the most. So hopefully I'm having the same effect for you, is that uh, as I read through these books, I'm obviously learning a thing or two myself, and hopefully you are as well. So once again, thank you for joining me. This is your reminder that uh, if you are indeed getting some value out of these books and out of these videos that I'm posting, do please like the videos, subscribe to the channel, Leave some comments down below. All of that fun YouTube -y stuff. Oh, and celebrate with me, won't you? That is just dynamite. It's all of the vanilla and caramel and spice oh, and sweetness that the Balvenie 12 year has to offer. It's just dialed up. <clears throat> this is so good. All of those complex flavors are right on the top. You don't have to go searching for them. just present themselves to you for enjoyment. Again, this is the Balvany Doublewood 17-year. This is a single malt scotch <coughs> that, that is first aged in whiskey oak barrels and then finished in sherry oak barrels, giving it that complex and it's outstanding. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to wait until every time I finish a book to have more of that. <laughs> That's unbelievable. All right, friends. for the conclusion of Tuesdays with Maury. And I will see you right back here for the next video. Good night.